applications of electrochemical cells. In this video, we will discuss some different types of batteries. This is an area under a tremendous amount of research right now, um, given how important batteries are to our day to day lives. And though we think our batteries are really good, they and they are actually quite good in terms of things like running our earbuds or our cell phones, but they aren't really good enough for everything we want to do. For example, using very heavy bulky batteries, we can still only get a small car to a few hundred miles. And the more batteries you add, the more bulk that you add, and so you start to get diminishing returns. Because batteries wear down and often have some relatively environmentally harmful to get chemicals, we also don't really want to have to replace them as often as we currently need to. It'd be better if we could get batteries that didn't lose their charges over time. Now, of course, you can recycle batteries and you can, you can re-pull those elements out so you don't have to go back to the earth to get them. Um, but I think, I think we all recognize that this doesn't always happen. So many of our renewable resources do suffer from an inability to, let's say, just turn it up when we need, for instance, when it's really hot outside and everyone has their air conditioning on. And so right now we're relying on methods which are pretty heavy on pollution and carbon dioxide when we need to do that. We have to basically fire up plants that are burning fossil fuels. So we definitely need to have better methods for storing and releasing energies if we really want to use all of these renewable resources. And I, I, th I think that we do. So batteries are one option. Though there's also a lot of other ways that aren't actually related to electrochemistry at all. Um, and so those things kind of go beyond the scope of the class, but just to kind of mention here that we're barely scraping the surface of this topic and batteries are one way that we could help make renewable resources more um, usable, but definitely not the only way. So getting back to what we are going to do in this video, though, in this video, we're going to discuss a couple of older types of batteries and then discuss lithium ion batteries and introduce the idea of fuel cells. One of the original batteries that is reminiscent of the batteries that we use today are called dry cell batteries. This is the battery pictured in this little cartoon, and these worked okay. Um, that being said, they had lots of issues with corrosion, and the current and the voltages weren't particularly stable. And then also they weren't rechargeable, which is obviously a problem for most usage, uses. You would use them, trash them, have to buy more. So these played an important role in getting us to better batteries, but they really aren't used that much today. We have a newer version of them that we do still use called, called alkaline dry cell batteries, where you replace the NH4Cl with um, either sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. So these are the alkaline batteries that we often talk about, and we still use them today in many of our devices, which require us to put batteries into them rather than ones that kind of come with the rechargeable batteries in them that we plug in. These, of course, come in many different sizes, though in our current age, you seldom see these giant C and D cell batteries. These were huge, expensive, and they had to be replaced often if you were using them in something big, like the boom boxes that make the appearance in the 80s movies. These have been largely replaced with internal rechargeable lithium ion batteries for a convenience, cost, and size reasons when we're talking about really big portable electronics. Um, of course, there are some smaller electronics where we still insert um, AA or AAA batteries. Sometimes it's just because they're kind of old and they've been around for a while, um, but every once in a while you'll, you'll still come across something that uses them. The nice part about this is that the the thing that uses the batteries isn't dead once the battery is dead. You can get new batteries. Um, unlike a cell phone that when the battery dies, the cell phone is effectively dead. Or, you know, even my earphones um, that recently died, they worked fine. It's just the battery had worn out. But instead of being able to replace the battery, I actually had to buy a whole new set of pretty expensive earphones. Um, so there, there are kind of some benefits to doing this. Lithium ion batteries are more commonly used today, given they are both rechargeable and then they degrade significantly slower over the recharge cycles. So you can get rechargeable alkaline batteries. Um, and the reason they never really fully took off is one, well, everyone forgets to charge them, but also over time, the alkaline rechargeable batteries did, did wear out pretty, pretty significantly. So um, lithium ion batteries do a much better job of not wearing out like that. These are not all identical. 
Um, and they all undergo slightly different reactions depending on exactly which ions are used. So I didn't really write the reaction out. If you're interested in a very particular reaction, you can go look up the reaction for that particular ion. Um, but there's lots of generations of lithium ion batteries. And there's reasons why you might want one in a car over something in a cell phone, for instance. A car and a cell phone are you know, pretty significantly different electronics. And so having slightly different batteries is, is a reasonable thing. And you can read more about this on pretty much anywhere. Honestly, the Wikipedia article isn't, isn't bad if you want to check that out to learn more about the specifics of different types of lithium ion batteries, but we aren't going to go into that in this class. Um, but one reason that you might want to use one over the other, for instance, is in some cases you get significantly longer lifespans, which is really important if you're talking about something like a car that needs to last for a really, really long time. Maybe not so much if you're talking about a phone that people tend to replace every couple of years. So lithium nickel magnesium cobalt oxide batteries, for example, say that one more time, lithium nickel mag, mag maybe I'm going to say it one more time, manganese cobalt oxide batteries um, are often used in medical, medical equipment, tools, electric vehicles, um, where that long life is super, super important. Moving back um, to a slightly older technology, we also have lead storage batteries. These are typically six cells, two volts each, that are connected in series. And so we call them 12 volt batteries. Um, that's kind of how these are standard referred to um, in a pretty standard way. So here I do have the reactions of the cell um, that are discharging. So in other words, this is what's happening when the battery is putting out power. And so you'll notice we have a positive cell potential. These are our car batteries, like the old car batteries that all the cars have, not just the electric vehicle cars. And so, of course, they need to be able to be recharged, too, so that you can start your car the next time. So when you recharge the battery, these reactions are all just flipped. Um, in your car, this recharge is done whenever you're driving by the alternator. And so the alternator charges the battery, and then the next time when you go to start the car, your battery is charged up. And then pretty much all of the electronics in the car are run off the battery as well. Um, these batteries are designed to put very large currents for a short amount of time. So that's ideal for, for instance, starting a car. It's not exactly ideal for, say, running a car for a really long time. Um, that's when, if you're talking about like a hybrid or electric vehicle, they're gonna use some sort of lithium ion style battery um, to get that kind of longer um, lifespan out of it. That being said, actually, most hybrid and electric vehicles will also have a 12 volt battery, not because it actually runs the car itself off it, but a lot of the auto accessories are all designed to run off the 12 volt battery because this is what runs your radio and your lights and things like that. And so they'll have this 12 volt um, lead storage battery as a um, accessory battery effectively just to run those sorts of things, which is kind of neat. Now, let's do a couple of questions just to check and ensure that you understand the basics of batteries. Again, this is a much wider topic than what we're going into, um, and there won't be any questions that are asked about specific reactions. You shouldn't spend any time memorizing these reactions or anything like that um, if you're taking my class. So this sort of memorization to me feels incredibly pointless given that you can just look it up on the internet. So let's walk through the type of questions that I do really care about. If a battery produces power, what does that mean about the voltage? Is it going to be negative or is it going to be positive? So if the battery is producing power, which is what generally you want a battery to do, that's going to be a spontaneous reaction and it's a positive voltage. Now, as we discussed, many batteries are rechargeable. In fact, most of our batteries these days are rechargeable. And when you're recharging it, is that going to be a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous reaction? Well, you're recharging it, you're, you're putting electricity into it, so that's a non-spontaneous reaction that's being driven. And then based on that, during that recharge is the voltage negative or positive of the battery, and that would be a negative voltage. Let's move on from batteries to something that's pretty similar to batteries. So this is, this is a really interesting topic um, that isn't strictly a battery, but because it operates so similar to a battery, it does often come up in conversations around them. So this is a fuel cell. In the diagram here shows you what is going on at the anode in the cathode and how the transfer of electrons can be used to do work. Now, unlike a battery, which has its chemicals contained within the cell, 
in a fuel cell, you actually supply it. You have to, well, fuel it. You're constantly adding in materials for the reaction to happen. So hydrogen fuel cells are of significant interest to the automotive industry since the byproducts are just water. And so this leads to less, less waste um, and they're also pretty light. So this significant reduction in waste and pollutants um, as compared to our regular fuel examples is important. Um, but it also doesn't require long periods of recharges since you can refuel pretty similarly to how you do with gasoline. Um, obviously you're not refueling with gasoline, but you can, you can pull in and you can recharge that fuel um, as fast as it'll pump. This can be really useful to vehicles that need to run for really long periods of time without recharges. So a commuter car that you drive back and forth to work, for instance, can be plugged in at home at night and then even often plugged in at work. And so, having you know 350 miles of range is is perfect you don't really need more than that for something like a normal commuter car but what about something like a city bus where they don't want to have to have a whole second set of buses where they leave plugged in to charge and you might say something like fast charging right you can do fast charges but fast charging tends to be pretty hard on the batteries um we don't really have a great way of charging fast and saving the battery life um, and so when, even when you do fast charges for different reasons, you generally tend to minimize them if you have an electric vehicle. So for something like a bus, you're not going to want to do that. Um, another example would be a delivery vehicle. So if you are talking about something like FedEx or UPS, having an electric vehicle that only gets 350 miles of range mm, very likely won't work super well unless you are in a very, very dense area where they just don't have to drive very much. Now, Notice that these were first developed for space applications. This is something that we see in science really often, and it, this is going to be a slight tangent, but I think an important one. We develop something for use in one specific area, and before long it can help us in many others. So we put a relatively small amount of our overall national budget into basic science in space, um, but the tech that can come out of it can make a really big difference in areas that nobody even imagined. And this even goes back to a little bit of what I started this chapter's quote out with. When electricity was first created, we didn't know what it was going to be used for. We didn't know it could lead to cell phones and computers and all sorts of things. So when originally developing these different things, um, we might not know what it's going to be used for. But putting money into that basic research is incredibly important to continuing to advance society. So it can often be tempting to say that we're only going to put money into things that people would deem really practical. You know, why, why go to space when we have problems that we can solve here? Uh, why go to Mars when we, have, when we have problems that we can solve here and there's an immediate need? And we should meet those immediate needs, but we don't want to set up a false dichotomy there. We also need to continue to explore and develop technology which can solve some of these problems on Earth that we're not going to be able to solve with our current technology. Or <laughs> that because of our political landscapes, for instance, we're going to need technology to overcome. Um, and so putting a relatively small amount of money into basic science, basic technology, and the things that we do with that, such as going to space can be really, really helpful for things here on Earth, such as making sure that our buses and our delivery vehicles have a renewable or have a have a clean energy option that otherwise they might not have because of our battery lives. All right, side tangent done. In this video, we went over a brief and non-inclusive and limited scope of the history of batteries. Keep in mind, this is just a tiny sampling, and I might recommend taking a bit of time to look into areas of battery development that interest you. Since there are so many, I'm not gonna really put them all here. Um, and because this is a general chemistry class, not an electrochemistry class, we really don't go into most of those anyways. We're just talking about the, the basic principles behind these batteries. But if you're interested in this, you should take a little while and, and maybe do some research on the side about parts of battery research that you are interested in. Now, many of you watching this are likely from UCI in my class or, or for watching it for various other reasons. Um, and so I thought you might be interested in specifically people from UCI that are working on different electrochemistry applications or battery development. And so I've added a few of their names here to give you a starting point to look at if you're interested in looking at something um, kind of close to home.